Hey everyone, so I think it's safe to say that when it comes to the Soulsborne Sekiro series, everybody has their favorite and least favorite feature per game. And I think that's completely natural. While all of these games build on the same foundations, they do differ quite a bit from each other. And there are things in each one that work really well, and there are some things which are like, well, yeah, this doesn't work that much. So what I thought I would do today is break down my opinions on what I think are the best and worst feature of each game within the Souls series. Now, before we jump in here, I do have to say that this is just my opinion. So if you agree or disagree with me, feel free to leave your opinions in the comments and let me know what you think are the best features and the worst features of these games. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. As well, if you're here and you're new, do like this video, it really helps out. If you're not new, please like this video as well and turn on post notifications too. I'm trying to get back to weekly posting, I've been slacking a little bit, as well as streams. I will make a separate streaming update because I haven't streamed in ages. So yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in with the first game in the series, Demon's Souls. Now for this one, naturally, I'm talking about the remastered version. Obviously, the two games are different look-wise, but gameplay-wise, they do retain the exact same mechanics, so I think it's fair to talk about the remastered version. When it comes to the best feature of Demon's Souls, I have to go with its experimentation. Demon's Souls obviously being the first game in the series, FromSoft really had a throw everything at the wall and see what sticks kind of attitude. and. While that doesn't always work, and there are a lot of bad mechanics in Demon's Souls, it does make for the most interesting game in many aspects. Demon's Souls has a ton of unique weapons with a ton of unique scaling, uh, like Demon Brand and Soul Brand, which work off your character tendency. There are a ton of unique bosses. Uh, some of the highlights are the old hero, which is actually blind, and you need to sort of stealth around him because he does a ton of damage. Or even a boss like the Leechmonger, which has this unique mechanic of throwing leeches at you. Or the Dirty Colossus, where you have to use the fire to burn the flies off. These do not, like, make or break the boss, but these are sort of kind of unique little puzzles and gameplay elements, which you really do not see in the bosses of the subsequent games. This also extends to the areas. In terms of visuals, I can definitely say that this game has the most variety, perhaps with the exception of Elden Ring when it comes to areas. All five of the Demon's Souls worlds feel completely unique in their own way, and they do carry unique gameplay elements as well, like you have to avoid the dragons in Boletaria, or Stonefang being more of like a maze and a puzzle area. Overall, this type of experimentation, combined with the very solid foundation and mechanics of Demon's Souls, which have remained in the series, is what keeps me coming back, because it's such a unique collection of bosses and areas that it's always fun to play through this game. When it comes to the worst aspect of Demon's Souls, I 100% have to give it to its upgrade system. This game has the least refined and most convoluted and confusing upgrade system in the series, and I'm so glad that FromSoft decided to streamline and make the upgrade system a lot more understandable in the subsequent games. First of all, with this upgrade system being confusing, I would just like to present you this chart that I found on the Demon Souls wiki. I mean, look at this shit. This thing looks like a Game of Thrones family tree. And this is just one of the upgrade paths, because there are actually two main ones in this game, each leading to different ends and different outcomes. It is absolutely insane. If you want to and can make sense of this, man, I praise you because this sure as hell looks confusing as hell to me. Aside from it being generally convoluted, the upgrade system requires way too many upgrade materials compared to how frequently these upgrade materials actually drop. Just to give you an example, some of the later upgrades for certain weapons require 10 normal shards, up to 9 large shards, and up to 9 chunks. And you never know until you get to that point of how much you actually need of a particular item. Again, this being with the fact that a lot of the large shards and chunks are kind of rare and difficult to acquire. 
Aside from that, the other materials are rare as well. Some of these materials for certain upgrade paths, like the Bladestone one in particular, drop from only a couple of enemies and they are exceedingly difficult to get on a normal playthrough. This combined with everything means that it is extremely difficult to upgrade a weapon fully and it is something that I've only done a couple of times throughout all my Demon's Souls playthroughs. Moving on to game number two, one of my personal favorites, as you probably know if you've been watching the channel, if you've been sticking around, it's Dark Souls, the OG Dark Souls 1. I love this game, so it was difficult to narrow down uh, all of the positives I have to the best one, and also all of my criticisms, but I think I managed to uh, sum it up pretty well here. For the best aspect of Dark Souls, it definitely goes to the world cohesion. I still to this day think that Dark Souls has the single best interconnected world within the series. I know, Elden Ring has freedom as well, Bloodborne has an interconnected world as well, however, no other game does it so well as Dark Souls does. And this comes down to one simple reason, and that simple reason being that warping is not given to you until halfway through the game. One of my main issues with the latter games is you have the ability to warp straight up and that really does take away from the necessity of exploring the actual world. Shortcuts are there in all of the Souls games, but most of the time shortcuts themselves are completely meaningless because you can always warp around. With that not being an option in Dark Souls, you do actually need to explore and you do need to use these shortcuts and these cool hidden like areas and loop banks and that makes the whole world feel a lot more cohesive. When you're exploring in Dark Souls, you always can guarantee that you will be warping back to some bonfire in a clever way, and if you venture into an area you're not supposed to, you always have the ability to track back pretty easily. And with that, that does mean that this game also has the best use of shortcuts in the series, having just like some fantastic ways to cut areas and that also adds to subsequent playthroughs. When you do know these shortcuts and you know how to utilize them, you can do a lot of cool shit in this game and it does bring a lot of unique elements to each playthrough. Conversely, on the other side, I know the worst aspect of this game is going to be a little bit broad, but I didn't know any other way to sum it up and that's going to be the post Anorlando section of the game. I think the DLC is what really saves the last, I guess like about a third of the game because the post Anorlando content is an absolute mess and FromSoft have always said that they didn't really have time to properly finish these areas and man that really shows. The post Anorlando part of Dark Souls contains I think some of the worst areas in the entire franchise, Tomb of the Giants with its unnecessary and annoying darkness the entire Isolitheron with its recycled enemies, ugly lava, boring design, huge open empty areas, it's just some of the worst. Even when the area itself is not bad, the last section of the game contains some of the worst bosses in my opinion. Seath and Nito are absolute pushovers compared to how much they are hyped up. The Bed of Chaos I think is the single worst boss, perhaps with the exception of the Dragon God in the entire series. And the Four Kings are not much better, being in a confusing arena and being just very annoying and providing challenge in a really not fun way. Yeah, this is an unfinished part of the game and it really shows. And thankfully the DLC with Artorias of the Abyss is one of the best pieces of DLC content out there because it is what saves the last third of the game from being an absolute pain to get through. Moving on to Dark Souls 2. You guys know I have a lot of love for this game. In fact, I think Dark Souls 2 is easily the most overly hated game in the entire franchise. This game does have a lot of good aspects and the fact that it gets so dismissed and so much hate really does irk me because there is a lot of good things about this game. And naturally a lot of annoying things as well, but that's why we are here. When it comes to the best aspect of Dark Souls 2, it really comes down to one thing and that is build variety. This game has a lot of weapons and with the way upgrades work in this game, essentially every single weapon can be made viable. Sure, Dark Souls 3 has a ton of weapons, Elden Ring has even more weapons, but I think Dark Souls 2 is the only one that really nails this aspect of 
Even if you have a shitty weapon, you can work around it and you can use the upgrade materials to make it into something completely viable. I mean, I've recently done a mundane ladle only challenge run of Dark Souls 2 and yeah, the weapon was functioning completely fine. This is one of the things that makes this game so replayable and allows you to have essentially a different experience in every single one of your playthroughs. This is combined with the many spells and magic categories in this game, again, allowing you the possibility to mix and match to your heart's content. And finally, armor and poise are still key mechanics in this game, so it is still possible to have poise and still possible to use a heavy build with heavy weapons, something which the latter games really diminished quite a bit. And this is all combined and brought together by the fact that upgrade materials are very easy to get in this game. The game essentially throws upgrade materials at you, allowing you to easily upgrade at least 3-4 weapons in a single playthrough. So you have a lot of options and you can change your weapon in the middle of a playthrough. And also there are a lot of respec items and it's very easy to respec your character. So if in the middle of the playthrough or towards the end you find a cool weapon, you're like, yeah, screw it, let's upgrade it, respec my character, and this is gonna be my main weapon. No other game I feel like allows this much flexibility in your build variety as Dark Souls 2 does. When it comes to the worst aspect of Dark Souls 2, I don't think this is going to surprise a lot of people. It's gonna go to the adaptability system. I still to this day do not know what from software thinking when they came up with the adaptability system this is absolutely the worst way to do iframes and rolls and it's no wonder that they've never gone back to this mechanic aside from iframes being tied to a stat is just plain stupid the mechanic itself is terribly explained just like with many other things in the series what this caused was that many players did not level adaptability on their first couple of playthroughs. I did this as well, I completely ignored or almost completely ignored adaptability. And this leads to a lot of confusion because you know how these games work and you know how rolling works and you're like, why am I getting hit by attacks I'm clearly dodging? It really also exasperates the hitbox issue on, in general that Dark Souls 2 has. Low adaptability just increases the visibility of this issue tenfold, where you're getting hit by attacks which landed like three feet away from you, and getting hit by attacks where you've clearly gone through the attack with your character. And my final issue with the adaptability system is that it essentially feels like a forced stat. Sure, you can choose not to upgrade adaptability. Just like with anything else, it's completely your choice. However, there's no denying that the amount of entertainment you get from this game diminishes by like 40% if you don't pay attention to your ad adaptability. You essentially need it to have fun and you need it to actually enjoy the game and have the same amount of tools in terms of your dodge as you have in other games. And because of that, it essentially means that low level or no leveling runs become a lot more frustrating than they need to be. Again, I don't know what they were thinking with this mechanic, they've never brought it back and with good reason because this just simply does not work. Let's move on to Bloodborne. Again, this is one of my favorites. This game and Dark Souls compete quite often for my top spot. Currently, I still think Bloodborne is number one. I love this game and again with these games I love so much it's difficult to think of the single best and single worst thing to highlight but with Bloodborne I can safely say that the best aspect of this game it's definitely its combat system. This game has the best implementation of the fast combat system which FromSoft have tried to replicate in Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring but I've never quite managed to refine it as much as Bloodborne does. Bloodborne is hyper focused on this combat system and every single one of your tools is tooled around this fast combat system. Whereas to me, sometimes Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring feels like a weird mismatch where they were sort of in the middle of whether to stick to Dark Souls or go with Bloodborne more and you kind of end up in the middle. The key difference with Bloodborne is that you feel just as fast and just as nimble as your enemies. This combined with the fact that you have powerful weapons and weapons with a lot of tactical options with the trick weapon system, you have many ways to approach each situation. You feel just as powerful as your enemies in this game and aggression is 100% rewarded. 
And it's so much more easy to execute an aggressive playstyle in this game because you are rewarded so much. Because the game is 100% focused on this playstyle, it can tool everything in terms of enemy moveset, weapons and attacks and everything around this playstyle. Meaning that despite it being so fast, you never feel outmatched and you never feel like your enemies have unfair advantages over you, something which does start to creep in in some of the latter games. Fantastic, fantastic combat system and it's 90% the reason, aside from the aesthetic of this game, which I also really love, that I keep coming back to it. Now when it comes to the worst aspect of Bloodborne, this is something I probably should have said at the start, that not all of these quote-unquote worst aspects are unequal, but you know, I have to come up with something. And I do think again that none of these games are perfect. When it comes to Bloodborne, the biggest issue I have with the game personally is its lack of build variety, especially early on. Now naturally Bloodborne has a much smaller pool of weapons compared to any other game in the series, with the exception of Sekiro. But the main issue is that some of the more interesting and unique weapons are locked away in the late game. And also, it's kind of difficult to sequence break this game in order for you to get to the weapons you actually want. Most of the times you have to settle for an inferior Chalice Dungeon version of the weapon you actually want. So, when it comes to the early game, you have maybe 4 or 5 options to start with. And that really does limit you, especially in the first few hours of your playthrough. Added to this issue is the fact that two of the weapons, the saw cleaver and the saw spear, are about 20-30% to better than any of the other weapons you can choose. So essentially, if you want to optimize and actually get to the weapon you want as quickly as possible, you're going to be picking either the saw spear or the saw cleaver, mainly the saw cleaver. This leads to, again, a lot of the early game feeling very much the same. You're using the same weapon, same tactics and all that, which really detracts from what the whole combat system has the potential to be. The first few hours always feel the same and that does mean that compared to other games where in some of the games the late game is a slog to get through, sometimes the first few hours of Bloodborne are kind of a slog to get through. We are going to be moving on to Dark Souls 3 now. Dark Souls 3 I've really changed my opinion on. I used to kind of not like this game, but in the past maybe year, year and a half, I really started to love it more and look back to it with fondness. I've played it a couple of times since then and again, each time I'm having more and more fun and seeing more of the benefits of this game. I think definitely the biggest strength of Dark Souls 3 is its selection of bosses. I think this game has easily the best overall selection of bosses, with some of the strongest contenders in the entire series, and also without any real horrible stinkers. I mean, you have the Dragon God in Demon Souls, horrible, Bed of Chaos, horrible. Dark Souls 3 doesn't really have a stinker like that. Sure, there are mediocre bosses, yeah, Yorm is not very interesting, the, what's it called, Curse Rotted Greatwood is kind of not interesting, but none of them are actively terrible. Conversely, this game has a lot of highlight spectacle fights. I think the Nameless King is fantastic, it's such a good build up to what this character has been hyped up to be since essentially Dark Souls 1, he finally shows up and gives you the satisfying fight you want. Pontiff Sullivan I think is a great midpoint, he is one of the better aggressive bosses in my opinion and I think that's one of the key things. Dark Souls 3 still has the aggression of Bloodborne but it also still gives you the tools to deal with it and it doesn't feel like honestly like how Elden Ring does where sometimes I feel like the bosses completely outmatch what your character is capable of. Dark Souls 3 also has one of the better final bosses, with the exception of, I think, what's his name, German. The Soul of Cinder is one of the best final bosses. Also, I have to mention the DLC bosses, which I think are some of the highlights in the entire series, and are definite 10 out of 10s, talking about things like Slave Knight Gale, who is a satisfying and fitting final boss for the franchise, and the Demon Princes, which have one of the most unique mechanics and most interestingly implemented unique mechanics in my opinion. So yeah, Dark Souls 3 bosses keep me coming back because they are super, super well designed and super fun to fight. 
On the other end, the worst aspect of Dark Souls 3, in my opinion, is definitely its linearity. While this game does have split paths, it still manages to feel extremely linear. To me, Dark Souls 3 almost feels like FromSoft didn't trust you with actually making decisions and sort of just limited you to a left or right path and you're like, okay, well you can go to the Cathedral of the Deep or you can do the whole Catacombs and Abyss Watchers area first, but you're still doing the same thing. You're still essentially locked into the exact same linear path. The game just allows you to stray sometimes. So yeah, whereas with Bloodborne, the early few hours feel kind of similar, with Dark Souls 3, almost all of your playthroughs feel exactly the same for 90% of the time. The game gives you, again, little side paths and little ways to mix up things, but essentially there is no big sequence break. I mean, I know about the fact that you can go to Lothric Castle early on if you're good enough, but that one really feels pointless if I'm being honest with you, especially with how difficult the enemies are and looking at how the game actually intends you to proceed. It doesn't actually feel like you have a choice, that does feel more like a sequence break. This is compounded by the issue of upgrade materials being extremely segmented. You essentially have very clear blocks where here you're getting titanite shards and only titanite shards. Okay, now here you're getting large shards and nothing but large shards. And finally you're getting chunks and nothing but chunks. It's very difficult to again sequence break that and get yourself an early powerful weapon, which is kind of a shame because these things like breaking some path, going to a difficult area early and getting like a plus five fire weapon is one of the coolest things you can do in a Souls game. And it's kind of a shame that Dark Souls 3 takes that option away from you. They made a whole video essay on Sekiro's combat system. Alright, next game to cover on our list is going to be Sekiro. You guys know how much I love Sekiro, I recently made a whole video essay on Sekiro's combat system. And it probably comes as no surprise that the best feature of Sekiro, in my opinion, is its combat system. Now, what Sekiro benefits from is it being hyper-focused around one type of combat. And with that, there is a lot of polish and depth added to the combat system, which is sometimes not found in the other games. I mean, the other Souls games have to contend with the fact that there are a ton of weapon options and a ton of different playstyles, whereas Sekiro is laser focused on one thing, and man does it do that thing well. That one weapon you have, the sword, of course along with your skills and prosthetic tools, is absolutely perfected. And with that, the enemies and bosses are tuned around this one weapon and one playstyle. Almost similarly to how Bloodborne does it, but even more refined. This game really has a unique combat system compared to anything else in the series, and really the satisfaction comes from learning and mastering this system. Really with each playthrough of Sekiro being more and more fun as you get better and better at its combat system, and you have more and more options to pull some flashy shit and just feel like you're good. You feel like you're a master swordsman. Overall, it's just very satisfying and just the fact that it works so differently to any of the other games also brings a lot of freshness because it doesn't feel like you're just mastering a different type of dodge. It really does feel like you're learning something entirely new. And of course, what people accuse this game's combat system of being, which is one note, is completely not true in my opinion. There is a lot of variety. You just need to add that variety through what skills you use and what prosthetic tools you use. I mean, it's no secret that Sekiro's combat is its best feature and it is definitely the best aspect of this game. Now when it comes to the worst aspect of Sekiro, it really comes down to it being the other side of the same coin as its hyper-focused combat system, which is its replayability. The replayability of Sekiro does suffer, this is simply a fact. You cannot deny and you can never say that a game with one weapon and okay, a lot of skills and prosthetic tools, but one way weapon can compare to an actual RPG like Elden Ring with, I don't know, hundreds of weapons. It's simply not possible to replay Sekiro back to back, unless you're like really, really hardcore. 
To me, this is more of an occasional enjoyment. I play Sekiro every one and a half to two years and every single time I have a 10 out of 10 experience. But simply put, just due to the way this game is structured with the set characters, the set story, and the focused gameplay, it's just not as replayable as others in the series. Eventually, the combat system is going to get boring and sometimes you just need to take a break. Listen, I can't really criticize Sekiro on much, honestly. I think this game is very polished, but again, its replayability is probably its biggest negative feature. And finally, we have reached the end with the latest game, Elden Ring. Now you guys know, I've made two full video reviews on Elden Ring, so I think my opinions on the game are clear, although they are still changing, even with my current third playthrough fourth playthrough, I should say, uh, I still have my changing opinions, but I think Elden Ring has a lot of fantastic highs and quite a lot of big lows. When it comes to the best feature of Elden Ring, it definitely has to be given to its freedom. This game, there's no denying it, gives you more freedom than any other Souls game simply due to the nature of its open world. The game trusts you to explore, it trusts you to go through the world, and it trusts you and gives you the options to decide on your build as well as to sequence break and do things essentially in any way you would like. You have so many ways to tackle every single combat encounter, whether you want to actually engage, whether you're gonna ride around things with your horse or you're gonna stealth through. The same thing can be applied to the field bosses. You have complete freedom whether you actually want to fight a field boss or not. The way the whole game is laid out allows for some fantastic sequence breaks, allowing you access to many weapons and spells, as well as subsequently many builds early on. If you want to go and jump up some cliffs in Kaelid to get some crazy weapon early on, yeah, do it. Do you want to entirely skip Stormvale and do Lyurnia first? Yeah, like, do it. It, the game just gives you so many options and with that this means that no two runs are the same and you have so many ways to tailor your run from the very get-go. The game gives you that choice and allows you to make these choices in how you want to tackle a playthrough. And when it comes to the worst part of Elden Ring, uh, again maybe this is a little bit too broad but I do have to give it to the late game balance. Basically once you get to the mountaintop the excellent balance of Elden Ring up to that point flies straight out the window. The game is doing a very good job up until this point of slowly ramping up the difficulty of, you know, Lyrne is a bit harder than Stormvale slash Limgrave. Kaelid is a little bit harder than Lyrne. The capital city is a little bit more difficult than Kaelid, well in some parts. It does a very good job of slowly ramping everything up as you're leveling your weapons, you're leveling your characters. The mountaintop and anything past that feels like it has that difficulty spike, but it's like 30 to 40% higher than it should be. Enemies have so much HP, they deal so much damage, the bosses are absolutely insane again with the amount of HP and damage they deal and it starts creeping into that territory where it starts becoming not fun. I think some of the late game bosses in Elden Ring and the late game enemies are challenging not in a fun way, which is very much the opposite of how a Souls game should function. It's such a jarring increase in difficulty that it almost feels like an oversight, except it's not. The bosses, I think, are also, again, way too overtuned. The fire giant has insane damage. Regularly one-shotting people that are not at, like, at least 55 vigor. Let's not even get started on the godskin duo that is, first of all, just lazy boss design, but also manages to deal insane damage and have a huge HP bar. Really, I think the only late game boss, I've said this many times before, that gets a pass in my view is Godfrey. Godfrey is fantastic. And finally, this is all capped by what I think is probably one of the worst final bosses in the series, the Elden Beast. And it's a shame because as fantastic as Radagon is, he really does get dragged down by being an Elden Beast first phase, to the point where it's like, Oh, this, this didn't need to be a two-phase fight. The Elden Beast feels completely pointless 
And again, Radagon would have been a perfectly fine final boss. Just like with Dark Souls 1, I really do feel like the last third of Elder Ring is simply a slog to get through. And my enjoyment of the game up until that point is at least like at a 9 to 9.5. And as soon as I start exploring the mountaintop and anything beyond that, it drops down to like a 7 and 7.5. 7 Sure, I still overall like the game, but it's such a jarring difference that I can't help but point it out and can't help but say that this is, in my opinion, the worst feature of Elden Ring. And with that, we have come to the end of this kind of a marathon video. This actually turned out to be a lot longer than I expected, but I really wanted to get my thoughts out and also sort of explain them so you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, like I said at the start, do give me your opinions on what your favorite and least favorite features are when it comes to Souls games, because I'm really interested to hear what you guys think. And yeah, like I mentioned, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, it really helps out. And stay tuned because there are going to be more videos Souls related and not on the channel. Thanks for watching everyone, take care and peace out.